On Thursday, I attended a celebration of life for one of my clergy colleagues, Cynthia Langston Kirk. It was a wonderful celebration and person after person witnessed of her joy and her inclusion, her servanthood, her presence. Her life obviously made a difference and the stories that people shared about her were compelling and made us all wish that we had known her just a little bit better. And don't we often see that whenever we attend a memorial service, we, we wish that we had known more about the person or persons or events of those whose stories we hear. Every single one of us has a story, not only about those we know and love, but about our own encounters with love and acceptance of grace, of joy, of inclusion, of servanthood, of presence. The fifth membership vow of the United Methodist Church is witness, the opportunity to share the story of God in Christ Jesus, what we call the gospel or good news. An art gallery said to a local artist, I have some good news and some bad news. The artist asked, well, Let's start with the good news. So the gallery owner said, the good news is that a woman came by today who loved your work. She asked if the value of your work would go up when she died. And I told her most definitely. So then she bought every piece in the store. The artist said, well, that's fantastic. How can this be bad news? Well, she was your wife. Friends, we are surrounded by good news and bad news every single day. But bad news definitely gets better TV ratings. So doesn't it seem like we hear a whole lot more of that? But friends, we celebrate and worship a God of good news. And we are the privileged ones who are called to share that with the world. So in today's gospel reading, we find Jesus at the temple. And some of the people who were with Jesus were absolutely mesmerized by the building itself. And they spoke in awe of its beauty, the center of the Jewish world. I mean, have any of you ever been by a marvelous cathedral or a beautiful church edifice or something where you just sort of breathe in awe? of the beauty of the building itself, I think most of us have had that kind of an experience. So it's really quite a shock when, instead of agreeing with them, Jesus says, well, you know all these things, these beautiful buildings that you see? Well, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon the other. All will be thrown down. I'm guessing that didn't go over well. Raised a whole lot of questions. And I'm asking us to ask questions as well when we hear things like that. And question ourselves, do we see buildings, traditions? Do we see things of the world that are the most important thing to us? I mean, what? things do we see in our churches, in our denominations, in our nation, in the world, in one another? Because, my brothers and sisters, what we see is to what we can testify, to what we will give witness, whether it's bad news or the good news that we give to the world. Because our testimony, our witness gives voice to what we claim Jesus sees and to all whom God sees. 
God needs us to be the eyes of the gospel when the world and those who have the loudest voices in the world seem only to see temples and towers and how they're adorned with beautiful stones and who is right and who is wrong and who is in and who is out. We are called to have a vision that is instead is intent on seeing what God sees and who God sees no matter what. And when we question, well, how on earth are we going to testify? Or where will we find words for our witness? Jesus reminds us, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to counter or contradict. And then he goes on, to tell his disciples that hard times are ahead. Wars and destructions are going to visit this place. The Romans will tear down the last stone. And if that's not bad enough, he says, it's going to get even worse. The Roman armies will even detain you because you follow me instead of their gods. I'm thinking that's about as bad as bad news can get. But Jesus didn't leave them without hope. Yes, they would experience adversity, but they had good news too. If you remain faithful, not one hair of your head will perish and your soul will live in peace. Barbara Brown Taylor said, when I say I trust Jesus, that is what I mean. I trust that the way of life leads through perseverance not around it. And the world needs that message of God's faithfulness in times of adversity more than ever today. And then Jesus throws the bombshell. And in those days of adversity, you will have opportunities to testify. Now, lest you think otherwise, all of us have shared good news at one time or another. Mark and I went to see Frozen 2 on Friday, and we have shared with everybody how wonderful we thought it was. When we read a really great book, we want to share that book with others. Maybe we have a delicious meal at a new restaurant, and we witness to others about how good it is. And when we witness about good news, We're invitational in the way we tell our stories, right? I mean, we want people to experience what we have experienced. As United Methodists, we share the gospel without cramming religious truisms down people's throats, hitting people over the head with contrived cliches, or shouting condemnations from the street corners. We share the gospel in the spirit of love and grace. That is the cornerstone of the Wesleyan tradition. So consider this. The church has been around for 2,000 years, touching every generation of humanity since Christ and spanning every continent on the earth. Countless numbers of people have come to know and experience the saving love of Christ and have had their lives transformed. The witness of the church has resulted in seismic changes in the culture, from the abolition of slavery in England and America to the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, from giving women the right to vote to feeding starving people. And how... Has the church helped make those things happen? Well, it's happened one life at a time. It's the result of individual lives being transformed and those lives coming together and being bound in the body of Christ. It happens when followers of Jesus begin applying the values of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, those values of the kingdom of God to the critical issues of the world around them. It happens when people allow the story of the gospel 
to become the story by which they live, one generation after the other. One day, a boy asked his mother, remember that antique vase that has been brought from down from generation to generation in our family? She replied, well, yes, what about it? And the boy confessed, this generation has just dropped it. We cannot be the generation that drops the vase. Jesus' love must continue to be shared through whatever means possible. And it can be made real only as people like you share your story and become the living expression of God's love in the lives of others. How do we do that? Well, when talking with people who really would never call themselves Christians or maybe have a little bit of interest but have never found themselves in church, we discover that people are really interested in what you were like before you experienced Christ, how you came to know and experience him. And even if you're not quite sure what kind of a testimony about that you have, they're even interested in why you come to church, which obviously you all do, if you're not convinced about Christ and what Christ's role is in your life. They want to hear about your journey and your opinion and your story. And then they want to know what you've been like after you've encountered what you say is unconditional love and grace. What is it about your church that has made you different? What is it about your encounter with other Christians that has caused you to have a better life? And then they want to know what you've been like since you've had that encounter. Now, you might be sitting back thinking, there is absolutely no way. Maybe you don't feel like you have much of a story to tell. Yours might not be dramatic or compelling or special. Maybe you don't feel like religion is something that ought to be brought up in conversation. It's too private, too personal. Maybe you have too much previous baggage associated with previous church experiences that you're just really wary of this whole God thing. And friends, I want to say your anxieties are real. And there are many, many people who share them. But the solution may be a bit simpler than you think. Because witnessing is sharing your story in whatever way God has uniquely wired you to do so. It's about doing the work of Christ and being his witness in the way that you live your life. Regardless of how you do it, the important thing is that you do it. Because believe it or not, your story is important. Because it includes joy and sorrow and pain and faith and love and you know it better than anyone else. And it is important to God. And God wants to use it to continue God's greatest ongoing project. The transformation of the world. Almost 25 years ago, Richard Dreyfuss starred in the movie Mr. Holland's Opus. Mr. Holland is a high school music teacher who is passionate about music. He loves Beethoven and Bach and Mozart. For Mr. Holland, music is about heart. It's about feelings, moving people, and something beautiful. And it's not about notes on a page. But how do you communicate that passion to a bunch of teenagers who have as much energy for Bach as they do for household chores? When Mr. Holland starts talking about the classical composers, he meets a sea of blank faces and bored looks. 
And then one day, Mr. Holland discovers something amazing. He starts playing one of the hit pop songs of all time. And all of a sudden, the students perk up, their feet start tapping to the beat, their heads start nodding with the rhythm. You like that, huh? Says Mr. Holland. Do you know what it is? It's Beethoven. This pop song has taken one of Beethoven's melodies and set it to a rock beat, played it with electric guitars rather than violins, and given it lyrics that speak about boys and girls falling in love. All of a sudden, Beethoven is not some ancient relic of some bygone era. All of a sudden, Beethoven is relevant. Beethoven becomes meaningful to Mr. Holland's students. Beethoven connects. Friends, when some people hear about Christianity, they can sometimes be a bit like Mr. Holland's students. Their eyes glaze over, their face goes blank, and they're bored by it. They're telling us, I'm not interested in a faith which is nothing more than an ancient relic of a bygone era. I'm interested in a faith which is a dynamic force in my era. I'm not interested in a faith that speaks to the questions of yesterday. I'm interested in a faith that speaks to the questions I face today. I'm not interested in a faith that dredges through the issues of the past. I'm interested in a faith that engages with the issues of today. And the wonderful thing about the Christian faith is that it can be like Beethoven was for Mr. Holland's students. It's a song that can be played anew in every era, a melody line that repeats throughout history, but played using the instruments of our time with a beat that we can dance to. And the task of the Christian church is to take this ancient song and play it in such a way that it connects with people of our time, the mood of our time, and the issues of our day. Desert Skies is working really hard to take this ancient song and play it in ways that connect with the world around us. Throughout this stewardship series, We've heard stories from people that we love and respect as witnesses. We've loved hearing their stories. Many of you have shared how much you've appreciated hearing from people you don't normally hear from. And the cool thing is, every single one of you has this kind of a story of how Christ has made a difference in your life. This week, the Church Conference of Desert Skies United Methodist Church voted to define ourselves as a community that is ready for the voice of all people by passing a statement of inclusion that welcomes all people and gives them a chance to fully belong to this community of faith. That's a witness of love and grace and inclusion, and I'm so grateful for leaders who have worked so hard and diligently to lead us to this place. In your bulletin today is an invite card with details about our Advent and Christmas Eve services. As I was picking them up while walking down the aisle, I noticed some of you might have let them drop. Our ushers have them for you um, if yours slipped out of your bulletin on your way to the seat. This is not for you to put up on your refrigerator. This is a tool for you to use to invite someone to join us at some point during this Advent or Christmas season. For as the choir so beautifully sang, when we give voice to one great Alleluia, God's perfect grace will bring us home. We are that voice, the voice of the one great Hallelujah. And nobody will know about God's home if we don't lift our voice.